functional as well. Um, anyone old enough to remember text adventures probably remembers having a piece of paper at their desk um, and having to write down and record everything that happened as you moved around and creating breadcrumbs for yourself so you didn't get hideously lost. Probably did get lost anyway. Um, did other people do that? Other people did this, right? If I was in a room, I could see you nodding or looking confused, but <laughs> I'm just going to assume you did and that we were all budding little cartographers. Um, oh, yeah, I can go back to the chat. Yeah, so that we were all budding cartographers here mapping our way through um, these text adventures that um, James reminded me earlier that some of them didn't even have um, mappable logic. So that's why you got lost all the time, because it didn't actually work exactly how you thought it would. Um, so we would be mapping for practical purposes, but if any of you also like me found yourself doodling in signs um, and hippie dragons at the edges, um, you're participating in decoding and recoding the space of that game and taking it from program to paper. And with fantasy games now, because they're so heavily visual, uh, those maps that we made for fun become part of the set dressing of the world and they can play as important a role as the character structures, material culture, um, in building an identity uh, for that world. So I think it was mentioned a couple of times yesterday just how important visuals are to players and certainly in my research I found that a feeling of consistency amongst the visuals of congruence is way more important than um, uh, um, photorealism, fidelity, uh, like real life fidelity and bleeding edge graphics. As long as things feel uh, consistent, as long as they feel authentic, uh, to return to a word that Rob uses all the time, um, players are pretty happy. So what this means is that maps have their own set of visual tropes that really prime us for the kind of spaces that we're traveling in, both physical and temporal. So in fantasy games, the kind of um, pseudo medieval games that I'm really interested in, we're signaled to that medieval-ish temporality, uh, typically by the parchment map. So I've got some. Yay. Um, and just like the brushed ink style maps that those fantasy readers were pinning to the walls of their dorm room, medieval-ish games key the player into the fantasy mindset with these parchment maps, which are often kind of yellow, a bit crumbly, uh, torn at the edges, crinkled paper. And I think the reason for this is that in our minds, uh, they connect with pre-modern maps that we have seen in the real world, either on TV, in museums, uh, at the library, maybe we've been lucky enough to, um, you know, see one in real life, which are also often yellow, crumbly, a bit frayed and torn around the edges. Because they're centuries old, um, maps and games don't seem to take into account this um, interesting temporal distance between medieval maps and us now and the fact that that distance is closed between the player in the game who is contemporary with their medieval space and their medieval map. Um, we still get the kind of old, frayed, dirty paper uh, just because it comes becomes such a pre-modern signifier for us. It's what we think medieval maps look like, so even if you're there in the space at the time holding it, it should still look um, yellow and old. So depicting the map in this way doesn't actually add anything to the functionality of it. It doesn't help you. It probably hinders you, actually, in a lot of cases. Um, and it instantly creates this old world appeal and probably feels more authentic, more congruent um, to players who are expecting to be in this medieval fantasy world. So um, you've got some of these yellowy parchment maps. You can see in the World of Warcraft map, World of Warcraft map, which is in the top right, this is a, a bit of, um, wow, it's my favorite continent. You can see it's curling over at the edges. Um, and the Dragon Age map, which is the bottom left one, even has some fresh looking bloodstains all around the edges. Um, and that game was pretty memorable for the amount of blood in it, actually. If I recall correctly, your journey across that map was plotted via splats um, of blood. And you do, in that game as a player, leave a trail of bodies in your wake. So uh, yeah, and also your characters regularly end up just splattered in blood and gore. You can be having quite a normal conversation with them, but they're absolutely covered in blood. And those little details, the aesthetic details of the map, really connect with the um, the violence of that world, uh, the blood soakedness of that world, um, and help connect with the character in the world that's being created in the kind of two-dimensional map that you have to keep pulling up. 
Similarly, just kind of note the other little things on these maps. So in the margins of the North End map, you can just see some of the important things to the location. So in the top right, you've got a floating city in the clouds. Um, in the bottom left, you've got a walrus person. These are places and people you can meet. Um, and then similarly on the Skyrim map, which is the top left map, you probably can't read it, but just near the um, compass in the bottom, there's a name of the map maker and a date. And interestingly, you can then go and find a book written by that cartographer. Who They're not a character in the game. They just also happen to have written a book that you can go and find and read in the game. And you can read about the time at which they produce that map and their commentary on making the map that you can use in game. So there's some really interesting uh, metatextual stuff going on that really connects the thing that you're using to navigate with the identity of that world. And we also find that these maps tend to mark places out by dominion uh, with family crest marks or something similar, breaking up the map by political boundaries. Um, and the how politics is done within games is like a whole extra thing. But I find it interesting that this also translates a lot to maps. Um, and you can see those on the Skyrim map in particular, those little crests. Um, and James and I were just talking about how uh, those crest markers actually often end up becoming fast travel markers. So for a fantasy world in which adventure is such an important thing, exploration and travel are so incredibly important. Once you've reached a city once, you can then fast travel there and skip out all of the travel and all of the exploration. Because once you've walked down one road, apparently that's it, you've walked down them all. Um, so I think, I'm sure he'll probably want to say something about that later. But yeah, I do find that really interesting that these, these markers become ways to get out of actually having to do any travel around the map. Uh, for convenience. Um, so that top left map of Skyrim is not actually the in-game map. Um, it looks more like the top left one on this slide. Um, it is like a satellite view looking down, you can see the clouds, but there's no roads on it. Um, and a lot of players did not like this because it neither created a sense of the depth, the cultures, the values of the world, nor was it useful for finding your way around because it didn't have roads on. Um, I hated it. It was really difficult. Um, and to this end, modders come to the rescue. So some of the most popular uh, mods are for the map. And I've just shown you two here. So a quality world map does two things. You can either use the original map, which is this satellite top-down view, kind of topographical map, and it adds rows. So it actually functions. You don't find yourself running into a mountain or off one, which I did repeatedly. Or you can switch it to this paper map, um, which is really beautiful. It also has roads. Um, and that has been downloaded 11 and a half million times, that mod, to change the maps to either become more functionally useful or just more medieval looking. And on the other side, you've got the paper world map, um, which all it offers is this kind of nice brown parchment paper map. And that's been downloaded a million times. Um, and again, it just has this more medieval-ish, pre-modern look. Um, and you can see as well the little marginalia bits and pieces on it. Um, there's a ship and the uh, compass with the map maker's mark, which has just been cut off by my terrible cropping. Um, interestingly, this map that you see on the right is the map that appears in the game. So it's used by characters. You can see it hanging on walls. Um, that is the functional map of the characters living in the world of Skyrim. So I'm always curious about why the developers decided to go with the satellite map um, when so many players, real players, actually preferred the brown map. And the brown map was the one that was packaged uh, in the special edition of the game. So that uh, the one on the right will be the one that, you know, um, thousands of fantasy players will have pinned to their walls, not the one on the left. So, having just shown you a bunch of maps that I like, um, really what I want to say is that there's two key things that um, I want to raise as long as long along with some of um, James's thoughts about about doing travel in games. Um, I want to think about the way that maps are so often used as an agent um, in the spatial narrative of the game, um, the ways that it is being done and the potential ways it can be done to make it better. That in itself is um, interesting, 
probably accidental overlap with real extant medieval maps that also mark out uh, culture, beliefs, values, um, time, the sense of self within the world, not just cartography. Um, probably an accidental overlap, but one nonetheless. Um, and then I'm also interested in how developers, as I'm, I'm not one, I've never made a game, I'm interested in how developers negotiate that tension between the artistic and cultural functions and the practical functions of a map, i.e. as a guide uh, in fantasy worlds that are ever increasing in scale. Uh, so yeah, that's just some of my thoughts. Great, thank you very much. It's um, all very interesting and I uh, and see lots of map appreciation in the comments there. Um, finally, I'd like to introduce um, Robert Horton. Um, Rob teach, is a, teaches um, early medieval history at the University of Winchester, with a specialization in Northern Italian politics and society uh, and relationship networks between the 10th and 12th centuries, uh, all topics close to my heart, and in um, Middle Ages and modern games. Um, he's also the games editor, editor at the Public Medievalist. Uh, so Rob, if you would like to um, take it away, please. Brilliant. Um, thank, thanks very much, Dan, and also James and Vicky, who, who have been remarkably thorough, and I'm starting to regret not conversing with the two of you and figuring out exactly what you guys are going to say. Um, so you know, this, is, this is a really fascinating topic, and it's one I don't normally get to think about so like James I've, I've taught I've taught about medieval travel previously but never really thought of it in connection with games so what I think I'm going to try to do here is yeah Vicky's very neatly covered um, RPGs and fantasy maps and so forth so I'm going to go a bit further to the, to the strategy end of the scale and focus primarily on games like Civilization, on Crusader Kings, that sort of thing um, which has worked out very neatly because that's the sort of game I most frequently end up playing. What I want to start with though is I, sp I suppose it's just talking about how how the maps we see in games they're, they're, they're in a very well they're in, in the same position as a lot of the representations of the Middle Ages that we see in games. So exactly like Nico was talking about yesterday, there's all these different sorts of medieval authenticity that we see rolling into these things, into games. But at the same time, we're, we're looking at the expectations players have for the games, a degree of realism making making the map that looks like the medieval world or indeed a fantasy medieval world and also the roles that maps have to play in storytelling and world building just like what Vicky's saying there but I think beyond this we've got the specific the specific role that maps have to play within medieval games or at least the impact that the fact that we're looking at these maps through a game has on how they're portrayed and how we use them and as a result of that well there's the practical issues of how do you create a map within within a game set in the middle ages or in a game more generally um the issue of of yeah creating maps that are relatively easy to use much like vicky's been saying about the problems of the default skyrim map and yeah, the propensity it has to send you flying off a mountain for no visible reason um and also, yeah, the player agency and objectives. So going back to what James was saying about so why do players travel and how does that tie in with what the map's going to be used for? And of course, yeah, player agency, because players will mess your maps up. I'm aware we're being recorded, so I've moderated my language there. Um, and I suppose this, this brings up a few points that I'd, I'd like to raise here. So first of all, First of all, we've got the standard issue between medieval maps and modern maps, and this has come up a couple of times, I know, with, with what James and Vicky have been saying, and also also in the chat. But just very briefly, so a lot of a lot of the medieval maps that we see, well, they're not like our standard ordnance survey maps. It's very much a fairly linear one stop after the other. So as we see with with the candles, I don't really care what's even a mile off the road. It's about this very linear pilgrimage route. And that's that's something we don't really see within within games. We tend to much more often see this more ordnance survey 
view of the world. Likewise, when, when we start to get images of medieval towns, I'm thinking of Italy in particular, because that's, well, that's, that's what I know most about, we'll see maps of the cities which to the modern eye don't look right at all. Nothing's in the right places at all. You don't have north-south directions, but you do have these major important sites around the city getting flagged up. And I remember this from a few of the older RPGs, particularly when you get the lovely feelies, the lovely paper maps delivered to you, you get a, a, a map of the city which is hideous for finding your way around, but you can find the key locations very well are, are displayed very easily. Beyond this, so what else do I want to talk about? Yes, yeah, so I know this is something that um, Austin and Thaddy have been talking about yesterday and um, to do with well, knowledge and communication within within or well, strategy games in particular i suppose so very often with games like civilization games like um crusader kings all of these strategy games you have instant knowledge of what's happening all around your empire if not even further afield and of course this is this is a massive step away from the situation in well basically within the modern world up until the last century or so much less in the Middle Ages. So even if you're ruling over a relatively small kingdom, say England, Scotland, where have you, if something happens at the edge of your borders, you're not going to hear about it for weeks. And I understand there are very practical reasons why you find out about it instantly within games, but within most strategy games, but I'm very interested in the way that this could be used as a game mechanic, so this denial of knowledge. So something we kind of see within Mountain Blade where eventually you can end up as a king ruling over a fairly sizable territory. And the first thing, you know, first, first you'll know about your borders being invaded is when one of your cities comes under siege and you're forced to react in that way. I've spent, I've spent four weeks in game time trying to track down an enemy army that's marauding around my, my, my borders. So there's some very interesting things to be done there. And I, I understand why they're not done normally, but it's something I'd be interested to hear more about. We also have the issue of the um, degrees of abstraction. So basically, within, within strategy games, every bit of information that you want to have for any place on the map, you need to create the data for every other place. So if you've got something like civilization, it's just a matter of, okay, so what does this hex do? Does it have a forest? Does it have a hill? Does it have a river? But when you've got something like Crusader Kings, something where you've got culture, various other values about each province on the map you need to have that sort of detail for every space on the map that that can lead to a whole load of research issues um particularly around well what what can we actually know about any given place in the middle ages how much of this are we just making up how much of it is just stuff that we're yeah that we're, that we're creating that looks about right I know Vicky's talked a bit about maps as storytelling, but again, this is this is something else that we can use. I suppose all that I'd, I'd add to this is some of the older role-playing games where, where we have access to particular points are restricted until you, you've completed the quest. So it's it's almost so the areas of the maps are locked off until the story can advance. But I suppose more more benign, well more more gently softer storytelling through climate shifts. Um, I suppose my particular example for this is is within Morrowind. So this old one of the older Elder Scrolls game, where the end game is played out around the slopes of of a, of a semi-active volcano. So you go from exploring lovely pasture land as the game starts, going through increasingly barren deserts as the game progresses, interspersed with other bits of landscape until ultimately you have the final confrontation essentially on the slopes of Mount Doom. I think this is possibly, it's a very convenient technique of storytelling through travel, and not only because well, you're traveling so much throughout the game, it feels like an epic adventure, but the ways in which you, yeah, the map kind of reflects the culmination of the story. And finally, I'd like to talk a bit about um, the collision between maps and imperialism and colonialism, so in particular within strategy games, but just in general. And I think this is, this is something that's come up a couple of times yesterday, but within a lot of strategy games, the default objective is to conquer the world. So this is something that goes right the way back to the start of civilization. Yes, technically you could build a spaceship to win, 
but more often than not, the first victory screen anyone would see would be the one that says, congratulations, you have wiped out all life on the planet, or rather you've conquered all life on the planet. And this remains the case even, even within more modern strategy games. So I know more recent editions of Civilization, they've introduced a lot of different victory conditions, but by and large, the default is to still expand, to still exploit, to still exterminate. And this, this remains the case even with games like Crusader Kings, where there, there aren't any, any set objectives within the game. Players, by default, will, will resort, resort to just painting the map their particular colour, even though the game's very much been designed, so that's not the only option. And indeed, that's not necessarily the most fun way to play the game. Beyond this, there are also, yeah, also issues around em the presentation of empty worlds within strategy games, like civilization in particular. You have the various different, different civilizations, but most of the map is only occupied by, bar by barbarians, if anything else. There, um, and also within, within RPGs in particular, um, the presentation of fantastic races and the use of these races to present racism on a geographical or a global level, I suppose. And the issue with how there's almost always a fantasy Europe, which is inhabited by humans, and the rest of the world is inhabited by, well, non-humans, by fantasy races. There are, of course, exceptions to this. So um, I, I saw a couple of examples here. So At the Gates, which presents you as the barbarians for, for a change, bringing down the Roman Empire. And uh, I particularly enjoyed Reigns, which places you in the role of a king, but basically gets rid of the map entirely. It tells the story of a grand strategy game, but without a map, which I thought was, was very interesting. And one final element of that is where are the nomads in strategy games? And I appreciate there are various reasons why you can't, well, why it's more difficult perhaps to represent nomads in a game like Civilization. But by and large, they're relegated to background supporting roles they're just there to be conquered maybe to give you a bonus technology because these backwards barbarians are somehow more advanced than your glorious civilization so yeah a bit of word salad there um but a lot of, there's certainly a lot of issues to dis for further discussion i think so thank you very much great thanks rob um I think your mention of nomads at the end of the talk there has given me flashbacks to the Huns showing up in um, Attila Total War and destroying large parts of my map. Um, so, yeah, there are uh, very interesting and uh, great discussion there.